Hello and welcome back to another organic chemistry video. It's been six months, but um, I'm back. And today we're taking a look at the International Chemistry Olympiad Problem 7 from 2019. So the actual problems. So this one is called Ring Motion in 2 Catenane. So it's going to be a fun one. It's obviously organic. All right, so let's start by reading the question. In 2016, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to this person, sir, that person, and that person. I don't want to butcher their names, that's why I don't read their names. For the design and synthesis of molecular machines, an example of these is 2-catenane, a molecule consisting of two interlocking rings. In this system, one macrocycle contains a single phenanthrolene bidentate ligand. That means that it attaches two metals on two spots, basically. And the second contains two ligands, a phenanthrolene and a terpyridine, a tridentate ligand, so that has three sites where it can attach to metals. A copper ion is coordinated by one ligand from each macrocycle. Depending on the oxidation state of copper, 1 plus or 2 plus, two configurations are obtained. So you have this where the bidentate part of, of this ring attaches. Then we have the electron transfers. And if, it, if it's copper 2, then we have this where the tridentate ligand is attached to the copper. So basically, if you imagine this ring and you rotate it like that, then you get that configuration. The synthesis of the macrocycle is as following. We have this little root of synthesis. Question one, draw the structure of B. So let's see what it is. So we have this tripyridine looking thing over here. We react it with two LDA. Now, just looking at it, I have no idea what's gonna happen. But the reason I'm doing this video is to show you how I would go about solving these. So when you don't know what's going to happen, you look forward and hope that you can see some things that would help you solve. So in this case, I do actually see something. So you see this section over here, that's THPO. You don't have to know that because it is given over here. That's THP. So if you attach an O over there, then it becomes THPO just like so. So that means that this section of the molecule with the two carbons is going to be that section over here, including that carbon atom. So we're gonna have to functionalize these two methyl groups. And what does LDA do? LDA is a base, so that deprotonates it. We have three protons over here on each methyl. So the LDA, which is lithium diisopropyl amide, just like that, is going to deprotonate it and put the electron on the carbon, let's just say. And it's gonna do that on the other side too. And what we're gonna be left with, I'll draw it over here where you're supposed to submit your solutions. So there you have it. And now you can either do this. So two, two minus charges and lithium plus lithium plus, or you can just basically covalently attach the lithium to the carbon. It doesn't matter. So that's gonna be compound B. Moving on in the question to draw the structures of E, F, and G. So let's see what those are. Once we have the lithiated version of B, we react it with this guy, which attaches the THPO and the two carbons over here. And now we have a question mark and an E. So we don't know what that's gonna be, but we can move on and see that we react it with two equivalents of mesyl chloride and triethylamine. This reaction should be very familiar. This converts hydroxyls to mesylates just like so, into a good leaving group. So we need E to contain a hydroxyl, we know that. And then it has two sulfurs, so that means it happened twice, which is not surprising considering the fact that it's two equivalents. So it's probably gonna happen on both sides. Let's propose that this transformation over here just gets rid of the THP and leaves it with OH. So if I draw that molecule, then we are left with this guy over here, and that is indeed correct. Then as I said before, the mesyl chloride and triethylamine just mesylates the hydroxyls. So then we're just gonna have the mesyl. I'm actually gonna draw it out this time. So like that, and the other mesyl. And actually this is a point where you would really wanna confirm the molecular formula because it is given C23H27N3O6S2. So let's just double check that. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 carbons. Wonderful. Then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27 hydrogens. Also wonderful. Then we have 1, 2, 3 nitrogens as expected. And then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, oxygens which is not right so this cannot be the right the right compound and that's why you always 
always double check when you are given a molecular formula because I indeed made a mistake. These oxygens are not supposed to be there. This is the mesyl group. So I'm glad that I caught that. And in fact, mesyl chloride is given over here, so I could have just looked there. But anyway, now that we know that this is the correct compound, because this has six oxygens and two sulfurs, and we didn't change the number of carbons or hydrogens, we can move on to compound G. Let's see what that is. So we have the mesyl reacting with two lithium bromide to produce G. So if we have a mesyl, mesylate, I should say, and we have a bromide, it can do an SN2 and it'll produce the bromide. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. Let me copy this over, copy, paste. Here we go, get rid of the good leaving group, the mesylate, and replace it with bromide. So there we go. So that's gonna be compound G. And then moving on, question three. Out of the following reaction conditions, choose which one can produce E from D. So let's go back, let's see what that is. So E is gonna be the hydroxyl, and we're gonna to have to form it from D, which is the THP protected one. So if you take a look at this, that's an acetal. So how do you cleave acetals? Simply put them in acidic water or an acidic aqueous solution. So the correct answer is gonna be H plus H2O. In the synthetic strategy, mesyl chloride is used to obtain, it is used to obtain a good leaving group because we need a good leaving group in order to introduce the bromide via lithium bromide. And it's not a protecting group, not a deactivating group, and not a directing group. Question five, G is obtained by the reaction between F and lithium bromide and acetone. This reaction, as I already stated, is an SN2, a nucleophilic substitution involving two molecules, or two, I should say, species. That's, that would be the more correct expression. It's not electrophilic aromatic, it's not nucleophilic aromatic, and it's not SN1, so that's the only correct option. Moving on to question six, draw the transition state of the rate determining step of the reaction F to G, showing the 3D geometry. Depict only one reaction center. The main carbon chain can be re represented as an R group. So let's see F to G. F to G is the SN2 reaction. So we know what the transition state of that is gonna be. So I am going to draw it over here. So you have a carbon. On that carbon, you're gonna have two hydrogens. So I'm gonna draw it like this, then one going to the back and one R group going, let's say to the front. And then you have the half formed bonds in the plane of the paper going to the left and the right. On one side, we have the bromide. On the other side, we have the mesyl group. So I'll just do OMS. And then this whole thing is gonna have a negative charge because the bromide has a negative charge and our mesylate is neutral. And then to indicate the fact that this is a transition state, we have to draw the double dagger, and there we go. That is going to be question six. The synthesis of 2-catenane L uses the template effect of a copper complex. You don't really need to know what that means. But anyway, what we have here is this guy over here. And we react it with that guy and this copper complex. And it forms J, which is like part of our molecule. And then we react it with this oligomer of this little... I don't know what that is, polyethylene oxide looking iodide and cesium carbonate, which is a base to form L, which is our complex that we want. So question seven, write the full electronic configuration of copper zero in its ground state. Give the oxidation state of copper in complex J and write the electronic configuration of copper in the free ion corresponding to J. So this is where you wanna look at your periodic table, just in case. I'm pretty sure you know how to do this. What you can do is you can, you can depict the filled shells by doing argon in square brackets, and then you just finish the open shell by doing 4s1, 3d10, of course, because the 3d has the higher energy level. And of course, the it would be 3d9, 4s2, but it kind of swaps just to fill the, the d orbital because that's a more that's a better effect than filling the s orbital. Or you can write the whole thing out. I I won't do that. That's not necessary. You can just use the argon nomenclature. Oxidation state of copper and J. Now to figure that out, we can do two things. We can figure out the oxidation state over here and see if it changes. So the oxidation state here is going to be pretty simple to figure out. So we have. Acetonitrile, that's just a ligand, a neutral ligand, so that's zero. Then we have PF6. PF6 is a one negative ion, so that must mean that copper is a one positive ion. And 
by the looks of things, nothing changes, so we say that it's a copper one plus. But just to double check, we'll do the other, we'll do the other version too. We check out this charge is zero. Check out this charge is zero, and the charge of the whole thing over here is one positive. So that means that the copper ion is one positive. So we do plus Roman numeral one. There we go. And the electronic configuration of of copper in J is going to be basically the same as over here but you remove the easiest to remove electron, which is gonna be the 4s1, so you just do argon 3d10. All right, question eight, select the geometry of the copper ion in L. Assuming an ideal geometry of the ligands around the copper center, draw the electronic levels of the d orbitals subject to the crystal field. Fill the orbital diagram, give the maximum value of the spin of this complex. All right, so let's take a look at the geometry. You're gonna notice four nitrogens, approximately equally spaced on a, the surface of an imaginary sphere around the copper. So that's gonna mean tetrahedral geometry. So we select tetrahedral. And now if you remember, tetrahedral geometry has three degenerate orbitals on top and two on the bottom. And now we look at the electronic configuration of copper and J, which is gonna be 3D10. So that's 10 electrons that's gonna completely fill the d orbitals and to determine s you look at the number of half filled orbitals and you add up the number but there's none so it's just going to be zero and question nine out of the following compounds choose the one that can remove the copper ion in l to obtain a free two catenane so what we're looking for are complexing ligands that are stronger than just a regular pyridine so acetonitrile is going to be pretty weak, so not really. So the same with the hexafluorophosphorus ion. I don't know what the exact name is. The way you can figure that out, if you don't know, is just look up over here. We are using those ligands, and they are removed by the pyridines. So we know that the pyridines must be stronger. So you can't replace them with those. Now let's take a look at the rest. So you have potassium cyanide. We are going to select that because cyanide is a very, very strong ligand that attaches to things very strongly i think that's the word and tren is over here it's this amine with four nitrogens in it and now regular amines are more nucleophilic than pyridine amines which means that they also bind stronger to to d group metals so we're also gonna select tren all right next let's see the next question in two catenane l the copper ion can exist in two oxidation states what plus one or plus two and each of them exhibits a different coordination sphere, a tetra or a penta coordinated respectively. So here we have copper one, tetra coordinated. Then we have copper two, penta coordinated. Then we have copper one, penta coordinated. Then we have copper two, penta coordinated and copper two, tetra coordinated. The stability of copper one complexes can be inferred by comparing their electronic structures to that of a noble gas. Fill in the blanks with a number or a tick, uh, also known as a check mark in the US. <laughs> so let's see. The copper 1 N4 complex has how many electrons? So how do we determine that? So we go here, we figure out how many electrons copper 1 has, and then we add the contributions from the ligand. So copper 1 has 3d10 4s1 so that's 11 but it's 1 plus so we remove the 4s1 then we have four lone pairs so that's plus 4 times 2 so that's 18 electrons so we're going to say 18 electrons now if we go here what changed copper one still has 10 electrons and now we have five lone pairs so that's going to be 10 plus 5 times 2 which is 20 so that has 20 the copper one tetra coordinated complex is either more or less stable and the copper one penta coordinated. So we look back here, it says, the stability of copper one complexes can be inferred by comparing their electronic structures to that of a noble gas. So which one is more similar to a noble gas? Well, of course, 18 is, I think that's the number of electrons in argon, if I'm not mistaken. So that means that that's gonna be the more stable, which is copper one and four. It's gonna be more stable than copper one and five. Next up, fill in the solid boxes with the designation of the involved complexes in figure two and complete the sequence to achieve electrochemical control in the system using the following notation for dashed boxes. You can use the rotation symbol, the plus electron or minus electron. So let's move up over here because we're basically going through this. So I'm just gonna say that we're going around in a circle like that. So I have copper one and four, copper 
1 and 5, copper 1 and 5. In the bottom right, we have copper 2 and 5, and we have copper 2 and 4 over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to see what transformation these are. So this one over here, we are rotating the ring. So that's going to be a little rotation symbol. Now the way you figure that out is you have two attachments over here, but three over here, which is over here. So it must rotate in order to get there. And you have the two over here. Next up, we're not going through any conformational changes. We're simply going from copper one to copper two. You do that by losing an electron. So then you go minus electron, and then you have the three over here and two over here. But now you have the two over here and the three over here. So that's another rotation. So I will draw that in here. And then we're going from copper two to copper one, which is a gain of an electron. So we just do plus electron. And that should be the problem. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you had any questions, as always, just let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you learned something and I'll see you in the next one.